Hello, Thought Roomies. Welcome to the show. If you're new here, I'm your host, Hallie Rose. We just passed the one year birthday of the Thought Room, and I'm just so grateful. I really want to say that from the bottom of my heart to each and every one of you who has participated in this community and listening to this show. I think it's really, really cool that we have this blossoming group of people who are coming together and are seeking out knowledge, things that excite them and interest them. There's something deep inside them that's tugging them to understand and to grow and to learn more about consciousness, health, wellness, spirituality, love, communication, and I am so delighted that you have found your home here. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, I am coming out of a, a beautiful meditation this morning and a nice light stretch. And I am so feeling reminded of how important our morning routine is. This has always been something that I've had not always, but this has been something that I've had in place actually for probably the last five years to some degree. And it's always something that I'm fine tuning. And I love to have a little bit of, well, we call them the three M's. And this is something that I work on with my clients is one of the first things that we do when we get together and start our three month journey is look at what are you doing for your morning routine? And it's so easy to fall off of our morning routine. For me, that absolutely happened as I was traveling and then transitioning to move here to Austin, Texas. And always when we're in a new place, we can sort of fall out of what we know we want to or are supposed to do. Um, But the three M's are mindset, mindfulness, and movement. You might hear mindset and mindfulness and go, wait a minute, aren't those kind of the same thing? But they're not. There's a subtlety there. And so for mindset, you want to engage with something that primes your mindset for the day. This might look like a short reading from a book, a spiritual text that you're into, um, a teaching that you're into. It might look like listening to a podcast or an audio book that is intended at putting you in a state that you want to enter your day in. So someone whose teachings you value to prime your mindset, to get you into that space of receiving and emanating who you want to be. So that's mindset. And it's different from mindfulness because mindfulness is more like a meditative practice. So that would be something that you maybe are sitting in contemplation. Maybe you are doing a walking meditation outside, barefoot if you can, grounding with nature. That's going to be your mindfulness activity. And then movement. So movement can look like a few minutes of stretching. It can look like 30 minutes of a workout. It can look like dancing in front of a mirror to your favorite morning playlist. Just something to get the blood moving, a brisk walk, a jump on a little mini trampoline, whatever you have, getting your circulation going, oxygenating the blood and getting yourself really primed for a successful day. So I thought I would offer some of those things today as they were on the tip of my mind. But as we get into this interview with our guest this week, Aaron Alexander, Aaron will give you a lot more tips for optimizing your well-being. He is just a super incredibly knowledgeable dude, very down to earth, Aaron is a manual therapist, movement coach, and author, as well as the host of the Align podcast, which has hit number one in nutrition on Apple Podcasts. He has helped so many of the world's top athletes and celebrities and everyone in between relieve their physical and mental pain. This interview was actually done inside of his sauna in California, in Venice Beach, And 
this interview was recorded back in March. So I feel it's important to say that because you'll hear us having some conversations about things that were just at that time starting to come to the surface with the virus. And this was before we really even knew what this whole journey of 2020 was going to be. But beyond that, there's a lot of super valuable information in this podcast, and I think you will so enjoy it. And it's a quick one, so you'll be able to listen through to the end. This is just absolutely packed with practical ways you can implement upgrades into your life for optimal well-being. The last thing I want to say is I'm still in the process of doing enrollment for The Conscious Man, which is my small men's collective that's launching in January 2021. I am so over the moon excited. I wish you could see me right now because I'm smiling through the microphone. This is one of the coolest things I've ever created, truly and honestly. And I don't know if I ever will do it again, Somebody asked me that on an enrollment call the other day. Will you do another round of this? And I said, you know, my truth is that I don't know. But right now, I am so guided to take a small group and absolutely create some rapturous life change together. I've been studying relationships, communication, the dating world for a long time, um, both academically and experientially. And I have just learned so much that I cannot wait to share with this group of men. It will not just be about communication and sex and relationships. It will be about purpose. It will be about spirituality. It will be about a whole entire life upgrade, paradigm changing experience. And If that excites you, keep listening. I'm going to tell you how you can unlock the application. And throughout the month of December, I'm going to be getting on calls with men in this community who are listeners of this podcast who apply to this program. And we're we're going to be talking about if this is a right fit for you. It is going to be a big commitment, an exciting commitment, and a life-changing one. And it's three months weekly video calls with yours truly and your conscious brotherhood. We're going to go over the six pillars of the conscious man. And this program is absolutely packed with tons of course content material. So in addition to actually getting on the calls and having these weekly discussions and opening up a container with like-minded men to talk about things you've maybe never really talked about in depth in this way before. You will come away with some evergreen content, meaning you have it forever. You can use these tools. You can use little tips like the three M's. I'm going to be giving tons and tons and tons of things that I've learned over the course of my spiritual journey over the last 10 years, and you will have it forever to use. So if you are interested in just upgrading your being, then I want you to check out this application and see if it excites you. You can check that out by going to hallyrose.com slash men. If you punch in your name and your email, it will just send you straight to the application. You can look at it and fill it out there and then we'll set up our call. So without further ado, my friends, you're going to love this episode. Let's step into the sauna (laughs) and the thought room with Aaron Alexander. Alexander, welcome to the thought room. Thank you so much for being on the podcast yeah, with me welcome. today. Welcome to my sauna. Yeah. So we're currently in your sauna and I just did my first ever 
cold plunge mm-hmm. with you. And also you're rubbing some some salve. Yeah. Am I saying that correctly? That's Yeah, that's what I would salve. call it. Salve. Yeah, some people is, say salve. This is some weed butter of sorts, CBD salve or salve. Okay, what are you doing with that? Oh, so I had a, a wrist injury like a year ago that's almost on its, finally on its way out. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is just some stuff with some, it's got lavender and eucalyptus essential oils and all sorts of good things. And, and a CBD? Yeah, Did you say? some CBD in there. Yeah, so. CBD is super great for for inflammation, right? It is. I'm, I'm, I'm. I don't consider myself an expert of the whole cannabinoid system and mm. THCs and it CBDs and all the stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am partial to uh, the whole flower, so I think that a lot of the, the <laughs> CBD stuff is a little bit, not necessarily overhyped, but mm. it's a little bit sad that because of like the whole legality stuff, you have to kind of strip certain parts and. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of of the combination of mm-hmm. the two. I think they all they all work together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, definitely, especially with like um, for recovery and training. Mm-hmm. I've heard a lot of good things about cannabis in general yeah. in that sphere. I mean, I can't really speak to it personally, but is that something that you are a proponent of? Like THC? Yeah. We'll yeah, just, certainly. Yeah. yeah. So for me, I find THC very helpful. Like I won't I won't use it that often. It'll mm-hmm. maybe be like once or twice a week or so. Yeah. Um, and it'll be like the end of the night and everything like the house is organized and all the day is done. And I'll kind of have like a journal out and put some music on or listen to like a Ram Dass or an Alan Watts or some audio book that I'm interested mm-hmm. in. And uh, I find it immensely valuable for down regulation mm-hmm. and just calming the nervous system and mm-hmm. also introspection. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really... That's a, a, a component to the, uh, the cannabis plant that because we live in somewhat, I think of like a kind of like immature culture because of, of legal reasons, you know, mm-hmm. we, we put it into this taboo category, which just makes us ignorant to the, the, the value of it. You know, so with anything there, any tool, like a hammer, you can build a house with it, or you can like whack somebody over the head with it. And so cannabis is one of those really powerful tools that if you choose to build a house or build your, yourself with it, it can be very helpful. Whereas a lot of people's depiction of what happens when you use THC is like, you just eat Doritos and like, you know, watch American Idol. Um, <laughs> I, in, my experience with which that can is happen. not with me. I'm, it's so vastly different. Right. Because yeah, you're me, disciplined I, with it. I wouldn't even say discipline. I would say like the, the, the cannabis does the work. I don't do anything. I'm much less disciplined when I am sober, I would say. My sober mind is far more addicted than my than my high mind, I would say. This is fascinating. I want to hear more about that. Your sober mind is more addicted. Mm, yeah. So if like you've been using some type of anything psychoactive, so it could be like a cell sign, which isn't something I do like a ton either, but you know, maybe like quarterly, three times a year or something like that. It would depend. Sometimes it's it's none in a year. Um, or cannabis is more often just because it's a little bit, you know, it's the, the ride is, you know, it's like an hour and a half and then you're off to bed or whatever. Um, during those times, I have no interest in looking at my cell phone. I have no interest in um, thinking about creating, you know, wealth or power or uh, moving up the social hierarchy or, you know, developing this like Ram Dass referred to as like the somebodyness. Um, it's much more about introspection and uh, feeling love and connected and well and doing, doing good by the world and by myself. Uh, and then my sober mind can kind of drift into places more of like scarcity and um, kind of like fear, panic, especially now with the whole like coronavirus stuff. I was just thinking about that as I walked over here. I was like, wow, this is this is really kind of... I, I opened my Facebook, which I go on Facebook like twice a week. And the algorithm, or maybe just the, a true reflection of what's actually going on, was just that every single post was some, somebody's take on it or, mm. you know, the next article. And it's just... I don't know. I was thinking... I wonder what Aaron's take on all of this is because you're a big like community guy and mm. kind of what are I think you for young people, they don't have too much to worry about from my understanding. It's mm. more of a economic impact for younger people mm. and for folks that are uh, immune compromised, it could be a potential issue. But as is lots of forms of 
you know, viral infections and mm-hmm. flus and all that. Uh, there's like the actual deaths that have transpired due to the coronavirus is mm-hmm. actually comparatively quite low. Um, and so I don't think that personally, from what I've gathered from people that are actually like way more intelligent with the subject than I am, it seems like if you're a younger person, it's more just figuring out. It's a good reason to start looking at uh, your financial situation, hmm. you know, and looking at like our economy has been very fat for the last like decade, you know, so it's like a bull market. Um, and so I think having something like this is a little, um, just like a, a little signal to give people the the impetus to start paying attention to mm-hmm. the way that they manage their money mm-hmm. and the, the the structure of their business in case something like this happens. Mm-hmm. I think it's actually quite valuable. Mm-hmm. And anytime something like the stock market, you know, it like had the biggest crash since 2000 and whatever, uh, or maybe biggest ever, I don't know. It was very huge. One day it was just like, whoa, like fell apart. Um, in that, there's this whole other opportunity to buy, to start investing. You know, so I think it's like anytime... There's no just, oh, this is bad and oh, this is good. There's, okay, things have shifted. Now there's opportunities in a different direction. Um, So that's kind of my perception of it. Mm. And for yourself, as a young, healthy, fit person, you probably have even less concern because you have a daily regimen of things I'm sure that you do that boost your immune system. Do you? Yeah. I mean, mean, I think everything. You do the cold plunge and the sauna. Let's talk about that a little bit. Like, some people listening know nothing about that. So why is that an important part of your daily practice? Well, in the wintertime, it's much less, uh, honestly. But the in the summertime, I, I cold plunge like twice a day. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it, 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 it's kind of a similar story to like the, the whole isolating the CBD as, as opposed to allowing like the rest of the cannabinoid, cannabinoid system to be among the plant. Um, when you're or any kind of supplementation of anything. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a thing called the entourage effect, which is like the that when you incorporate, so say you're eating an apple as opposed to eating like a specific supplement from the apple, mm-hmm. all of those ingredients that go within that apple are actually, they kind of have this, they, they, can, they can boost each other. Mm-hmm. You know, so the way that nature intended it was to eat the whole apple as right. opposed to isolating that specific supplement from it. Right. Uh, I would look at that as well from like my immune boosting activities throughout the day or whatever, like just uh, doing this conversation, intentionally doing it in an infrared sauna Mm -hmm. so we can stack variables up. Mm -hmm. You know, before this, we jumped in the cold plunge just because it was kind of like a a reset. Uh, Going to the gym, I would choose to go to the gym outside and I'll be barefoot and exposing my whole body to the sun. I'll be taking sunglasses off. Mm -hmm. You know, so when sun is hitting your eyes, uh, one, it's tuning your neurochemistry, you'd say. You know, so it, it's that sun passes through a thing called the, the oh, what is it called? The suprachiasmatic nucleus is a place where uh, from there your brain produces various different feel-good neurotransmitters. You know, and so when you're getting that exposure to the sun, uh, it literally it like tunes your nervous system to feel well. You know, so you could take a vitamin D supplement or you get some infrared thing and like scan, pass it across your eyes or, or you could just go take your dog out for a walk in the park, you know, and stack a bunch of it. And then you could stack another variable and say, well, maybe I'll go out with a friend. You know, so now you're doing community on top of that, mm. you know? And so it's, to me, it's like when you do the isolated variables, I think you miss in like lifestyle, you miss out on that, that entourage effect of, uh, putting all of those healthy, health inducing variables together. Mm. You know, so I don't even think of the sauna or the cold plunge or any of that stuff. A big part of why I have it is for community. You know, so, so you can sit in the sauna and do podcasts like this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like <laughs> a scene. It's like a thing. It's like fun. It's silly. It makes people laugh. You know, so it's not just it's a standalone, isolated, immune boosting supplement. It's more like, okay, it feeds into the rest of my life. It enriches my life as a whole. So therefore it boosts my immune system. You know, you boost your immune system just by spending more time outside in general. Mm -hmm. You know, Shinrin Yoku is a fancy Japanese term for nature bathing. Mm -hmm. You know, so... Is that like forest bathing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Forest bathing, nature bathing. So just walking outside and, you know, breathing in the chemicals that are coming off of the plants, phytoncides and all the various different chemicals boosts your immune system. Like you're just being outside, Mm -hmm. you know, and then 
patients that are in hospitals uh, that have uh, exposure to windows, they can look outside, they end up being less sensitive to pains. They need less pain medication. So there's like aches that you might have in your neck or back or shoulders or headaches or whatever it may be. It could be like a nature deficiency. You know, and so then you're stacking Isn't that more. incredible? Yeah, it's wild. I, I feel but like- it's not at all. It's like makes complete, like you are nature. If you If you pull yourself away from that, of course, things start to get funny. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, so there's the whole, you know, biohacking sphere and there's this rewilding and like, where do you stand on the spectrum of that? I mean, can, can these things really be replaced with technology or is there just, do we just straight up need to be in nature sometimes? I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not an expert on that mm-hmm. conversation. My my, In intui- my intuition tells me absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it comes again back to like the, the entourage effect, but from a different perspective. Yeah. Like what makes the complexity of the human organism is so much more vast than an isolated bionic anything. You know, so if you try to, to transplant or, or switch out your your immune system, for example, uh, for some type of robot creature that goes through and raises white blood cells or whatever, as opposed to connecting yourself back into those things that naturally do that. Mm-hmm. The things that naturally do that, it's just such these, it's complexity on top of complexity on top of complexity on top of complexity. You know, and so, and then it all, there's these chain reactions between all of that. You know, so to be able to isolate one specific variable and think that that's not going to have a butterfly effect of cascade throughout the rest, uh, is really just, it's just like, that's mind blowing that, you know, we would think that we could do that, like outsmart nature in a sense. Um, I think in the end, it's all relationship, you know, so how can we work with nature as opposed to just saying, okay, we're bigger and smarter than nature. We'll, we'll do this ourselves. Uh, I think if that's the perspective, I mean, I think that seems very apparent, you know, but if that's the perspective, I think it's gonna be very challenging. So uh, I want to talk about your book, mm. uh, The Align Method. You also have a podcast, um, but you just recently released your book. Is mm-hmm. that correct? Yeah, yeah. And I would love to hear a little bit about your journey, um, the, quick, the quick story, and how you ended up doing what you're doing and why you decided you needed to write this book. The world had to hear about what you were doing. So I've been working with clients for uh, so 16 years is like the original, like starting to first professionally teach people about how getting to get abs and like muscles and lose fat and stuff. So were you just into into fitness before? Or did you, you know, did you study this at all? Like what what got you into that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what, so that's, that's what the whole, pretty much my whole life has been for the most part. So I got obsessed with bodybuilding at like a strangely young age. And then um, from there, that turned to personal training, and then that turned into uh, studying psychology, and then turned into rolfing, which is a form of body work, and then different forms of massage therapy, and visceral manipulation, and cranial sacral therapy, and then got into dance and martial arts, and just other different forms of like being inside of yourself, being in your body. Mm-hmm. Um, and all along the way, I've been working with clients, and uh, the thing that kind of the reason that I wrote the book in the first place was seeing clients, you know, over and over again and seeing us create progress and like, oh, cool, that neck thing, you know, your neck doesn't hurt anymore. Great. Your shoulder or your back or, you know, you feel like more aligned, like literally stacked up in your body. That's amazing. And then they come back like a week later or 10 days later and it's like they're kind of drifting back into that place. And I mean, that's a very consistent experience with many therapists of all sorts. And uh, the thing that I very evidently see with people in general, but clients in this case, was they needed to be adjusting the way that they inhabit themselves outside of sessions with me or whatever whatever person they're working with. And so they needed a manual on how they can start to augment their home and their office and their travel experience and the way that they work inside of their kitchen, you know, or the way that they breathe, the way that they use their eyes. You know, so you're eyes are, you can think of like the movement of your eyes to be similar to the movement of your biceps or your hips or anything, you know, except it's almost more meaningful in a sense 
because your eyes will control or, or have the, they're connected to the state of your autonomic nervous system. They're connected to how you feel. So when you're focused in on something for a long time, such as focusing on your cell phone, for example, you go into more of that myopic focused vision that sends a signal through the rest of your nervous system that it's time to buckle down, go into more of like a sympathetic fight flight, like get shit done type state. When you go into more a panoramic view with your vision, it calms the nervous system down and it brings you into more of like a rest, digest, parasympathetic, like, oh, wow, just taking it all in. And you know, along with that, you might have maybe a long exhalation, you know, oh, wow. Mm-hmm. You know, even that sound, wow. And as you do that, you're like, you're tuning your nervous system. Mm-hmm. You know, so as you're going through those different sounds, you know, being hungry has a certain sound, you know, or being well fed, being well stitched. Mmm. You go, mmm. One, that's that exhalation again. So that's like a calm nervous system. Two, if you can hear that, mmm, you can almost like hear it in your belly. It's like reverberating down low, as opposed to like, mmm. <laughs> you wouldn't do that. That's more up high. <laughs> You know, so you're playing your nervous system and your physical body with your sounds that you make. You're playing it with the breath, the style in which you breathe. Mm-hmm. You're playing with the manner in which you use your eyes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're playing it with your body language. You know, and so I don't see very many people looking at fitness from that lens. There's a, a, a handful, but uh, my intention was to communicate that perspective of fitness to, you know, millennial generation slash old folks, people that, you know, make like a simplified book for people to be able to really understand like a driver's manual for their body mm. that anybody can understand. Mm. Um, that's not structured to like impress people with how smart the author is or like make it be something that like the author and 400 people can read and understand. Mm. It's like, how do we take those complex ideas and make it digestible for literally any person? Mm. And so that was kind of the intention of it. I love that. This this topic is actually really near and dear to my heart because both of my parents are chiropractors. So mm. I was a chiro kid. I was adjusted five minutes after I was born out of the birth canal. And chiropractic was a big part of my life and remains so. And it's interesting just kind of walking around, talking to people that don't know my parents are chiropractors and people start talking about chiropractic and like, oh yeah, I went to this chiropractor once. And I went and I felt better and then it went away, like it got worse. And um, that reminds me of what you're saying with your clients, you know, they'd start to see improvements and then they'd go back into their life. And, you know, we have muscle memory. We are, our structures are used to acting in a certain way. And if you're walking in the same way all the time, you're still going to have that same knee pain, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I love that you're doing this. And I think it's important to bring awareness, like where everybody's just looking for like a quick fix, I think. And um, it really is about getting down to the root of the problem, not just addressing the symptoms. Well, quick fixes are good to get people in the door. You know, so I'm with the way that I communicate my own stuff. Typically, it's like more of a physical thing. You know, so if someone has neck pain or shoulder pain or back pain or any of that stuff, that's a great way to start a conversation. Uh, And then that could lead into something that could create like a, like a temporary, have like an analgesic effect, like foam rolling or using a myofascial release ball or something like that, kind of creating enough space or create space someplace else in the body, say the ribs or the diaphragm or, uh, or maybe working on the abdomen to kind of calm the nervous system down temporarily. uh, And then kind of send the signal to the person who's like, oh, wow, like that was cool. That took two minutes and I feel dramatically better. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably not going to last. Like that's, that's kind of almost more like a parlor trick, but I think there is value in those parlor tricks, you know, and it's not just to be like forgotten. Uh, it's just how do we make that parlor trick, which the parlor trick wouldn't have to be like smoke and mirrors. It could be literally like paying attention to your breath, you know, or breathing into your belly or put a soft ball, like literally like a soft ball, not like a, like a softball baseball, all that could work too. Uh, in your abdomen and breathing into that. Mm. Um, anything like that, doing doing breath work exercises, doing any of the visual stuff we, we were talking about before, just jumping around, moving your body. Like that's going to be typically the most helpful thing that you can do. If just you're moving experience. your body. Yeah, you just, just kind of move, like take a dance class, go mm-hmm. for a walk. Mm-hmm. How uh, much movement should we be getting? I mean, the 10,000 step thing is just kind of whatever. You just, I would recommend people integrate more active rest into their life. You know, so if you look at like like the Hatsa tribe is like a like a, a group of people that 
um, Western cultures seems to be enamored by in relation to like their microbiome and such, and also movement, and the steps they take and all that. But they also, a big part of their their movement is more active based resting positions. Like squatting. Squatting, kneeling, yeah, any of stuff. All the stuff that, it, that that's a big part of what the Align Method teaches people. It's like, how do we start to kind of be a little bit more hot like with our movement, but it not be weird. Like you can keep your couch, you know, you can, you don't, you could still drive a car. You don't mm-hmm. need to like, you know, burn an antelope under an open fire at night or anything. Like you can just, you can be a normal person <laughs> and you can just integrate subtle little shifts into your daily life that mm-hmm. make all the difference. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but that's a, that's a huge deal. Just the, the, like right now, as we're sitting here, we're changing positions a lot. I've got my right leg out in external rotation. I'm bending my right knee uh, or my left knee rather. You know, so in that position, I'm, I'm moving blood. So I'm helping with my own circulation. Um, I'm help along with that help helping with the circulation. I'm alleviating uh, any type of like common joint stress. Cultures that spend more time sitting on the ground have significantly less incidence of osteoarthritis in the knees and the hips. Pelvic floor dysfunction is lower. Uh, fall risk is lower. Um, fall risk, like I fall and I can't get up. You know, so if you, that's like, I mean, it's a big deal. It's like laughable as a young person. No, I'm not laughing but, at that. It just reminds me of uh, those commercials for those like little necklace buttons. Yeah, it's fucked it up. Yeah, so that's all like Western culture chair sitting stuff. That has yeah. nothing to do with humanness. That's not mm. a common human thing. That's like Western culture. Mm. You've spent your life in a chair since you were going through your developmental patterns as a baby. Right. And then all of a sudden you were plopped into a stroller and then you were plopped into a car seat. Then you got raised high heel shoes in the form of sneakers or whatever. Uh, then you're hunched over into a chair all day. Then you're handicapping and bracing your eyes into a, a myopic state where you're mm-hmm. just looking up at books. You're looking at computer screens now. You're looking at closed walls. You're not getting adequate sun exposure. That exposure to the sun literally changes the shape of your eyeballs. You know, so the myopia, which is it's like scary high. It's scary how how fast that's increasing with with cultures that are spending a lot of time inside and looking at screens. Um, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it's China. Adolescents in China, it's like 93% are, uh, are myopic, nearsighted at this point. And so that's not just that they're looking at screens a lot or looking up close a lot. That's a big part of it. You're training the eyes to do that. Uh, but it's also a lack of sun exposure. Mm. You know, so once again, it's the whole entourage effect of like, cool, I could be inside of a room doing eye exercises while I'm hunching over a chair, you know, and I'm like looking up, okay, cool, look at this dot, look at that dot. It's like, you could do that in like the supplement form of fitness or you just take a fucking walk. Mm-hmm. You know, go outside and look at the trees and watch a bird be enamored by clouds. You know, like that's, I I would imagine looking at from like a kind of egocentric perspective for humanity, a good reason why the world is so beautiful is because it pulls your attention out to look around and explore. Mm-hmm. And so when you have that, you look out and you explore and you get out of the way of just like swirling around your thoughts, your body starts to heal, Mm. you know? And so, uh, yeah, it's important. I'm sure some people are listening to this going, oh shit, I do all those things. I sit on the couch, I work on a laptop, I drive a car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Um, of course. And of course, we're going to say, read your book, but... Could you give like one one or two of your most tangible top favorite tips of like something that for someone that's listening to this going like, I want to start right away with getting more aligned yeah. in my day? Well, so one thing is, so we already talked about the sitting on the ground, so I won't, I won't keep on going over that. Um, make sure that you make it comfortable. Make sure that you're, you know, you have like a comfy rug and you raise your butt up against, up above the height of your knees when you are sitting on the ground. Raise so your butt up again. Up above the above, height of your knees. Okay. Yeah, it's very valuable. So if you if your butt is up above the height of your knees while you're sitting, even when, if you're on a chair, if your chair is too low and your knees are higher than your hips, you're setting your pelvis and your spine up for an imbalanced position. Mm. And so if you were seeing a personal trainer and they were teaching you how to squat or deadlift or whatever, uh, they would have you hinge your hips back. You'd reach your butt back, 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 and you keep that long neutral spine all the way up through your neck. Um, that's ideally the same way. If you were to land on a chair, uh, you're 
front edge of the sit bones, the ischial tuberosities, they'll will land on that chair and it'll keep that spine in a good strong stacked position. Ideally, when you're sitting down, uh, for the most part, it's not 100% of the time, but for the most part, you could drive weight down through your shoulders and it would uh, evenly connect down to your hips and actually almost feel like a massage. Mm. You know, so you always have the weight of gravity coming down through your body Right? Was it like 9.8 meters per second squared? I think is like that. That you can totally have that pressure pushing down on your cells, and when your body is aligned, it's stacked up, it's oriented in a position of balance. Then that pressure is actually beneficial for the body. When you take it out of balance, uh, joint centration is like a fancy word from that. When the joint's not centrated, when it's kind of teetering on the edge of the next one, and now we apply pressure to that. Now you have problems, you know, so now you have friction and now you have bracing and the whole nervous system goes and it contracts and holds on because it's, it's freaking out because if it makes the wrong move, then you'll potentially break yourself. So you think of like an analogy that you use in the book is like, think of if you're pressed up against a wall and someone's like pressing your shoulders up against the wall and they're like threatening you. Um, well, that would freak you out. But the big thing that freaks you out is that there's a wall behind you and you can't move. You only have one option to move. Mm -hmm. you know, so with your joints, when they start to drift out of that balanced position off to the edge, they only have you know, one or a couple options. The other option is, is disastrous. And so now all of a sudden at a, at a deep neurological joint level, that joint's saying, oh shit, you know, we're at the precipice of disaster. You know, and so that sends that signal to compensate up into the next joint pulls the next joint off balance and says, okay, well, you're so effed up. I'm going to have to F myself up the other direction to balance out that imbalance. And then that goes all the way up through the body. Mm -hmm. And now the whole body starts to brace down and contract because it's trying to compensate for whatever the core of that imbalance was. Uh, so a great way to start to ameliorate that whole production is through just taking your body through like natural ranges of motions. So in the book, we refer to them as, what do we call them? Uh, poses of like tuning mechanisms. So I wrote the book like like eight months ago. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's the, we refer to them as like like your your natural tuning mechanism. So when you're sitting down on the ground, that's like an inherent tuning tool that you've had since the beginning of ever. You know, you turn your legs this way, you turn your leg that way, you squat, you kneel, you sit on your toes, you lay in your side, you lay in your back, you lay in your belly, you roll over. As you're doing that, your body's going, it's like you're, you know, it's like you're, you're in a laundry machine. You're getting everything dry and you're twisting it out and getting all the wrinkles out. Uh, versus if you're laundry, if you forgot your clothes, you know, and they're all just kind of laying on top of each other and getting all moldy and wrinkled and jacked up. That's the common body that's just kind of sitting in the same position all day long. Ideally, you're in more of like the analogy they use in the book is like, I, I, it's the first time I used the laundry analogy, so it might not, not have worked. Um, but the analogy that I, I use in the book is uh, like a pizza, like a pizza maker throwing dough. So when you throw dough uh, with your cellular dough, in this case, uh, you want to you want to be able to to knead that dough from all the different angles. So you throw it up in the air, and you twist it, and you turn it, and you pull it, and you push it, and you're at a cellular level. Fancy term for this is called mechanotransduction. So when you are twisting and turning your cells, that mechanical movement translates into a chemical response. And that chemical response of, cool, I got, I got moved through a full range of motion today is a response of wellness. You know, and the response of just being hunched over is a response of, oh, I think my person's like dying or sick. Mm. You know, so that produces the, the, the hormones and the chemistry to be like, okay, the driver's dying or sick. I guess we'll figure this out. Right. You know, so if you, a, a healthy body will move in healthy ways. And if you don't move yourself into those healthy positions, then it will send a deeper cellular signal that you are unhealthy. And then that will create a feedback loop. So that's like a lot of like the self-help type stuff is like, you know, fake it till you make it and all that stuff. There's a lot of value to that. You know, so putting yourself in that position, you know, who do you want to be now visualize, I have this in the book too, actually, visualize how does that person breathe? How does that person move? How does that person dress? How does that person communicate? 
Uh, how's that person show up in relationships? How's that person, what kind of car does that person drive? What, you know, all that stuff. You're like, cool, yeah, this is who that person is. You're like, okay, cool, take it on. You know, and some of the other stuff might be monetary based. So you might not actually have that to, I wouldn't recommend people going out of their way to buy a, 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 like a fancy car that's unnecessary that they can't afford. That, that would put more stress on your system. Um, but you can absolutely tap into the way that person breathes. You can absolutely tap into the way that person walks uh, and the way that person feels. It's mm-hmm. so really visualizing and feeling those states. Now take that into your morning, take that into your next meeting. Uh, and then your cells are listening, and they they keep up with that. It's very it's very convenient. It works mm. that way. Yeah, it's 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 uh, another take on the law of attraction stuff. Yeah, yeah, law of attraction. I think is misrepresented, represented, represented, represented <laughs> uh, very often. I think it's valuable to have the visualization part. Um, and there is all sorts of research that shows that visualization actually literally does change your body mm-hmm. at a neuromuscular level. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's more research. We put that in the book as well. Uh, there's a specific study around wrist exercises where they had uh, three different groups. One group was doing wrist exercises, uh, like literally doing them. The other group was visualizing them. Mm-hmm. And then the other one was doing nothing. This study, yeah. yeah. And they do it with thumb exercises, they do it with free throws, they do a lot of different stuff. And what all that shows is that uh, your visualization muscle is, is literally a muscle, mm-hmm. but it's not a muscle. It's just your muscles. You know, so when you are doing an action, as well as physically doing that action, you're visualizing yourself doing that action. So when you are just visualizing it without actually literally taking your body through those motions, you're still running those programs, setting yourself up for that. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think there is great value in all of that. Um, but I think something that people miss, one, people miss like the feeling of what it is to have that thing or whatever. You know, they're like, cool. Like oftentimes we're like, I want a relationship or I want money or I want power or I want a house or, you know, whatever. That's like, I think a lot, at least in LA is like the manifestation. Uh, It's probably very common outside of LA. Um, But I think something is very valuable beyond that because a house doesn't, that's not a feeling. You know, it's still like separate from you. It's just a house. You know, so, but what you can tap into that is right inside of you is like, okay, what's it feel as I move into that place? You know, what does it feel as I'm signing the, the papers to, to buy it? What does it feel as I have people over? You know, and then you, you kind of start to carry that, that energy or that, that, that felt state. And then all of a sudden, the people that you're communicating with, you're like, oh, you're like a big house kind of guy. You know, or oh, you're like, a, you're like a, a safe, secure relationship type person. You don't feel you know, overly attached and overly clingy and all that stuff because you practice that sensation of feeling whole. And now all of a sudden, oh, wow, this, you just open up all these other new partners that would have before been repelled from you because you've accessed that state. But you also need to actually go out and meet some people. And so it's like, I think it's, it's just the manifestation thing. I think it's just like a, it's a part of it. You know? Let me ask you a very serious question right yeah, now. Yeah, sure. Ready, I'm ready for something comical. No, yeah. Um, so we're sitting across from each other and I'm just like <laughs> watching you pour sweat and I'm like why am I not more sweaty and because it's what it's 131 degrees in here does this well, mean I'm like I'm like super blocked up or something that I'm not sweating no. or like some people don't sweat it's like a condition one of my cousins has it I don't <laughs> it's know a it's condition called. no really that's it's a sexy thing. <laughs> no it's like a real thing different people sweat for different that's like one it's a it's a valuable thing if you are a big like sweaty animal it is a valuable thing because you'll do better in like the desert and yeah, stuff yeah uh, that's one of the things that separates humans from other animals. I feel like I do hunting. sweat, but wow, nice little puddle you got going on underneath you. Yeah, I do sweat. Genetic, it just, just takes a really long time. So like, wh- why would that be? Do you know? I don't know. That's another thing that I'm not an expert in. Um, I just, I, it's, I think it's more of just a genetic thing. It's probably like where your body comes from, mm-hmm. probably what your body has been exposed to ancestrally be my guess, but there might be some like sweatologist that has a better answer for that than I do. Mm-hmm. But there are some people that literally have, and there could be some type of Psychosomatic, emotional, something hmm. or another to sweating. Um, I just don't really? know. I just don't. I just no, don't know anything about that. I think there's a psychosomatic component to everything. I don't think there's anything that's there's no separation from the mind and the body. It's a hmm. continuous system. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but I have no idea anything of like the science behind sweating. Maybe it's my control issues. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe yeah, I, I can't know. let go into sweating. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I've, I've embraced my, my sweaty animal self. Mm, cool. Mm. Aaron, oh, I feel like I could talk to you forever about so many things, um, but I know we're keeping this one short. And so I want to give you the floor for the last few minutes. If you want to talk about any of your online programs, I know you're launching some right now, probably by the mm. time this podcast goes out, yeah. those will be up. Uh, if you want to talk about your offerings and also where people can find you on social media. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Um, so there's an online program that's called the Align Method. That's the, the addendum to the, the Align Method book. Um, and that is essentially goes into a lot of the stuff that we described now. So it's a lot of, uh, breathing exercises and meditation practices and, uh, lifestyle stuff. And then essentially like the fundamentals of self-care and how to integrate better mood into your life, what that means, why that matters. Um, and so that's, it's a seven week free trial. People are interested in checking that out. And so that's all at alignpodcast.com. Um, and then the book, the Align Method, that's a great starting, starting place, you know, so people can grab the book. And that's like absolutely a million percent my proudest thing that I've ever been a part of creating. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And uh, yeah, and then the podcast, everything, all my social stuff, everything is Align Podcast, including the website. So Instagram is what I'm most active on. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today. It's yeah, been so wonderful, wonderful to sit here and to, to sweat with you and to connect. Yeah, it's fun. Thanks for joining. Thank you.